Last of Us, The Last of Us, and The Last of Us are exclusive video games that each came out on the PlayStation 3, 4, and 5. But since I took my sweet time to make this video, it's also now in your beautiful little battle station that you call a computer. Congrats gamers, you get to mod your little hearts out like you did for God of War and Spider-Man. Well, I need to remind you who's out there. Listen to me. I get in trouble down there. You make every shot count. Yeah. Not gonna lie, it's pretty nuts that I'm making a video about The Last of Us in 2023. I, uh, didn't really think this was gonna happen. For those who are familiar with my itty witty channel, shut the f up! You might have been able to pick up through context clues that I didn't play PlayStation 3 too much as a kid. Even though I didn't own a PS3 and only played Little Big Planet sometimes at my friend's house on the weekend. I was still in love with my beautiful little princess the Xbox 360. And like all my ex-girlfriends I've ever had in my life, they eventually turn completely red on me after a brutal chainsaw bloodbath and then die on me mid Gears of War. And that's not good. Because I was really good at Gears of War. Anthony Carmine. Yeah, it was, it was just kind of cool. Okay. You know about AIRs, right? Have you ever wanted to know what Kanye would look like if he was white, or what Walter White would look like if he was eating Cheetos? Well, I got something for you. Today's video is sponsored by Wonder. Wonder is an app that turns words into digital art made entirely by AI. That you can get by clicking the link in the description, which also gives you a free trial of premium. And to use the app, all you have to do is enter a prompt like Drake eating cookies and watch as Wonder makes it a reality in seconds. Or you can get even more deep with it. I wonder. <laughs> That wasn't intentional, but I wonder what a fallen world would look like. Yeah, that's pretty much Vegas. Like, look at all these amazing things I made on the app. Yes, that is Black Elon Musk, and Saul Goodman eating cheese, and Joel from The Last of Us playing Halo. To make all these funny, crazy little creations, all you have to do is click the link in my description to download Wonder. Or you can then get a free trial of the premium version. With premium, you can get 20 plus styles, unlimited art uses that generate faster, and no ads. For real guys, I've just been having fun with the app, typing up random stuff because my humor is completely broken. So yeah, try Wonder out. Now back to the video. But after Xbox decided to make a DVR instead of a game console, I, st I still got it. You said Xbox on. I need to know. Because I was an idiot who wanted to play Halo 5 someday. It was not worth it. I didn't buy the Xbox One for myself since I was literally 11 years old playing Minecraft and Battlefield 4. It was my stepdad who got it for me. But him being a grown man, he saw that the X-Bone was a... Uh, not the best. So he got a PlayStation 4 for himself and placed its little bum bum in the living room. And a year later in 2014, The Last of Us Remastered came out for the PlayStation 4, which lined up nice for me since I was turning 12 in May and the game came out in July. So I used the $60 from that birthday and bought the game because I really wanted to see what all the fuss was about. I still have the case even to this day. Rocket roughed it up a bit in 2019 since he was a, a little puppy. We still love him though because he's our fun little guy. The Last of Us is a game that I will never forget about since I first played it. And since then, I've replayed it over and over and over again. It could even possibly be the reason I'm here making this video on YouTube for you to watch. As a kid, I always loved shooters and platforming games, but The Last of Us was the first time I ever got to experience a narrative masterpiece where I could feel the weight of what I was playing. I grew up with films that helped shape my interest and personality, such as Jurassic Park, Mad Max, Star Wars, and many other pieces of fiction, but as an 11 year old, I couldn't comprehend the beauty of 2001 A Space Odyssey, or how Alien was the revolutionary change of the sci-fi genre. I was too little, and while I enjoyed the combat of Bioshock, I was also too young to see its complexity. But with The Last of Us, I had no choice but to fully allow myself to be immersed with this game, since I had no choice but to be involved with this world. Because if I don't move, Joel and Ellie don't move either. And on top of it being third person with a lot of dialogue, I could tell that I'm not Joel. Get that camera the fuck away from me! But I get to be Joel. It's really confusing. Games are confusing. Play a sport instead. It's gold! A Doncic dagger! You Luka Donovich. Yes. I probably main a uh, Roadhog. Never mind, play games instead. The Last of Us, to boil it down, is a story about a man rediscovering his purpose in a doomed world through an innocent little girl that believes she could possibly put it back together. And you, the player, get to go on this journey firsthand and experience it with these two complex people in this really complex world. I struggled for a long time with surviving. And you, no matter what, you keep 
finding something to fight for. And quickly you discover that this fallen, broken world at times can be full of beauty, wonder, and innocence. Yes! Brick! Fucking But that same world is also full of violence, hatred, and tense decision making that could be the difference between life and death. <laughs> Shot the hell out of that guy, huh? But what makes The Last of Us stand out from other multiple copy and paste pieces of zombie media is that it's a well-written narrative with breathtaking performances, alongside beautiful character writing that makes these pixels on screen feel like real people. By the end of the game, you will know about all the insecurities, interest, and basic things such as likes and dislikes between both Ellie and Joel. And this level of intimacy was rare for a video game at some point. Master Chief, Isaac Clark, Doom Guy, Leon, even Mario, not the Chris Pratt one, the, the other little Italian man, are great characters, but they aren't real people. These are fictional dudes in a fictional world, but killing necromorphs and slaying demons is not why they aren't real. Yo! Pixels. A kid trying to whistle, a dad losing his daughter in his arms, which causes him to hate the world. A dad learning to love again, a child being loved for the first time by a parent figure, is what makes these characters real people. The Last of Us reinvented the wheel for storytelling in video games, and since then we've seen a complete change to the landscape that is now full of some of the best pieces of media I have ever experienced. As a kid, I only ever saw Kratos as a violent god killer. And when I played God of War on my God of War PSP. Things aside though, guys, like, man, the PSP was just so fucking cool, dude. And the PlayStation 3 that I got to play at my friend's house across the street sometimes on the weekend. Boy. It was fun to turn off my brain and kill all these gods. But in 2018, my mind was blown for a complete different reason. I didn't like God of War because it was fun like before. I liked it because it made me care about a father and son bonding trip. And in 2018, I got to play as Arthur Morgan in Red Dead Redemption 2, who is now one of the greatest protagonists I've ever played as. Dutch, Dutch. Uh, I don't think these experiences would have existed if it wasn't for The Last of Us, created by Bruce Straley and Neil Druckmann. All right, guys, we got the sponsor. So how about we go play this game for a good 10 hours, get this footage, and we edit it all together. Oh, yes, 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 I want to play for 10 hours, 10 hours all the time, nothing else to do, 10 hours of gameplay, yes. Now, that's a stupid idea. No sense to waste all that time to play something all of us have played a bunch of times already. To be fair, he's got a point. We can always just steal a Let's Play on YouTube and crop out the watermark. No, 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 we cannot do that. I'm making chicken alfredo tonight, and I've already bought the ingredients. This is the fourth time you've all tried to flake on dinner, and I'm starting to lose my patience. It is kind of rude to interrupt the meal. We all don't hang anymore like we used to, and I look forward to these meals. Plus, we've counseled a bunch of times. And he does make a really good Alfredo. I'll give him that. Ooh, that chicken, chicken Alfredo has got me this bloody loving it, son. Let me tell you. All right, all right. We're not all going to play the game. Enjoy your dinner. I'm going to make a phone call. Yo, hello, Zane. This is Skipper. Um... Okay, so I'm making this video. I got the sponsor. Yep, yep, I got the money. Now, I need you to record all the gameplay for me. Can you do that for me? No, no, look, I'm really busy right now. I need you to do this for me. <laughs> it is, it's not a question. I need you to do this for me. Okay, shut up. Shut, 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 shut the fuck up! Shut up! Shut up! I gave you a fucking order! You're gonna do this for me right fucking now! 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 Alright man, uh, send me the gameplay when you're done, um, <laughs> have fun with it, it's, 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 it's a good ass game, you'll enjoy it, trust me, just, have a good time man, uh, call you soon, bye. It is over, Tess! I think of all the lives we'll save. Ow! It's all your fault! <laughs> Maybe some people don't like to play video games. They can't bunny hop, get a victory row while hitting the gritty. Look, I'm here to bring you a million dollars. Or use a blue shell last second like a spineless coward. So where I get to know about Joel and Ellie, Kratos and Atreus, Arthur Morgan and <laughs> <D> Dutch. <laughs> 
okay. I had a good thing going on where it was like adult and kid. God damn it, man. I fucked it up. I get to know about these cool people through gaming, but mom, grandma, and my stupid little sister that tells me I spend way too much money on Lego will never get to see these wacky and fun little guys that like to punch and sometimes kill people a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of people who complain about the last fussification of video games. Jesus, that, that took me like 10, that took me like 10 tries off recording this video to say, by the way. They don't like that so many games are now structured like long TV shows with lots of cutscenes and cinematics. In your first playthrough, you see what it does to the dead body. They turned it into this stupid dragged out cutscene that just comes. Ah! friend from work and hey maybe they're onto something why make these games into shows if they're pretty much shows already right mm. nope you're wrong. wrong because while the last of us is a movie like experience there's still a lot of video game stuff involved in the video game like shooting people killing people shooting people shooting people killing people and setting them on fire <laughs> But there's also a lot of boring stuff like moving Ellie on a piece of wood for the 50th time or grabbing ladders over and over again. And yeah, that's not that fun to watch. But the boring stuff is tolerable because at least it's you who gets to do this stuff. So it's semi-engaging. But watching everything like a show is, it, it's stupid. Cause at that point, just play the game. It's a video game. Unless you're like in a weird circumstance where you can't afford a PlayStation console with the Jurassic Park skin wrap that you got by selling your soul to the devil. <gasps> I understand. I concede. Just watch Markiplier play it then. Oh my god! Oh, I did it! Ah! Now that's quality content. But as hit rapper and philosopher Ice Spice once said, boy, let's keep it a buck. Mom and dad are gonna watch Markiplier kill people and play with pieces of wood for 10 hours? That ain't gonna happen. <laughs> it's not gonna happen. Are you sure about that? But now imagine if you made this pretty much TV show video game into just a TV show so that mom and dad don't have to watch these Let's Players. Also your coworker Susan now doesn't have to buy a PS5 with a cool Jurassic Park skin job to see this little girl say the F word a bunch of times. Are you gonna pay me? Okay, no, 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 not that one. The monetization's been a little Kanye crazy lately. But imagine how many more people are gonna experience this 2013 story for the first time since it's easy to access. Video game adaptations are not a new thing at all. Good, faithful, and successful video game adaptations are a new thing entirely. And it started in 2016 with the Angry Birds movie. Have you ever stolen anyone's children? Huh? Have you? I mean, you look like you would. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How the hell did that joke get into the movie? <laughs> There's adaptations of media to media all the time. Books usually get a good run. Who doesn't like a good read of Harry Potter? Anime has some pretty good adaptations from manga like Chainsaw Man. Of course, uh, I wouldn't know because I'm not a weeb. Get that out of here. There's even been recent adaptations of Legos, like literal Lego bricks that are only good for draining my bank account. But video games, they, uh, never got a good rap. Nor does anime to live action. Those have, uh, also been pretty bad. Boo! Dang it! 2005 Doom didn't have a Doom guy ripping tear through demons trying to speedrun. Instead, you got The Rock playing Space Army. Max Payne didn't have a cool action noir story. It had Marky Mark, and thank God he didn't have an Asian co-star. That could have uh, that could have gone pretty bad. Need for Speed, the game about going fast. Watch the new Average Pixel video, by the way. It's pretty good. Um, <laughs> as Jesse Pinkman with a bunch of explosions while he's screaming. Tekken was awful, Far Cry was awful, Resident Evil had nothing to do with Resident Evil at all. Shut the fuck up. And this was the Super Mario Bros. movie, the famous video game everyone knew about just by looking at it. Has nothing worth looking at. This is Bowser! This is a Goomba! Jurassic Park came out a month later after this movie, and that was adapted from the book and became the biggest movie of all time! Of all time! Now it belongs to those dirty blue people. I'm only human. Super Mario Bros. sums up everything when it came to video game adaptations in the early days. <laughs> Studios enjoyed the IPs of these video games, but did not like the video game parts of these video games. Cause God help if somebody put any cartoony video game crap in my Mario movie rather than whatever the hell this is. 
It's really bizarre to look back at. I know video games were looked down upon in the early days as cringe nerd media, but the insecurity is hilarious. Instead of having a cool video game movie about the game it's based off of, they'd rather just make the most generic nothing movie instead. What's even more crazy is that I framed this like it's a back then issue. No, this is still happening to this day. 2016, you had the Assassin's Creed movie. You used to be nice. Which was a soulless cash grab. You could tell it was tone deaf when they used I Am A God from beloved album Yeezus in the trailer. Kanye West? What the fuck? No, I don't want to listen to this garbage. <laughs> In 2015, you had the Hitman movie, which was horrible. And the next year, you had the World of Warcraft movie, which... Hey, Blizzard, only fucking nerds play this fucking game! Nerds! Losers! Losers! Mortal Kombat messed up twice. And the first one wasn't even that good. It was just really funny in a so bad it's good way. Resident Evil tried to be about Resident Evil for once, and yeah... They still messed it up badly, but Naughty Dog though. Unfair advantage, it's easy to adapt their source material since the games are already made like movies. The Uncharted film had Tom <laughs> Holland as Nathan Drake and Marky Mark as Victor Sully, and they put Tommy Boy in Fortnite. Now, no hate to Peter Parker, but the film was, um, it was awful. It was horrible actually. The reason that these video game adaptations haven't worked is because corporatization leads these films to greed, which creates a massive disconnect from the people who like the original pieces of media. Like all you had to do was make a cool Indiana Jones movie without Harrison Ford. Get the fuck out of my house. That's what the games pretty much are. Why'd you do this instead? While I know that recent Sonic movies aren't bad, it's crazy that it had to take a mob outcry to change Sonic's art style to not be creepy. He's gonna be this weird realistic looking creature rather than a fun cartoony guy that likes to run fast. And people didn't like it. It was horrible. So they redid it and it looks way better. Which means that it's not all doom and gloom. Detective Pikachu remains faithful to the art style in a real world. The Pokemon don't look like hyper realistic freaks. The Mario movie is actually in the Mario world, not trying to use the face of Mario with some weird mobster twist. It's a fucking disgrace. Video game culture is becoming more accepted and widespread. And as these video games get older, so do the people that once played them. And then those same people who grew up with these video games get to work on the same movies about video games. But as the years keep going, we're still seeing a disconnect from people who are in charge versus people who care. So video game adaptations need a bunch of W's to show that there is potential and it's starting to happen. Arcane and Edge Runners were animated adaptations of Cyberpunk and League of Legends. And and they were both amazing. They were visually stunning, but more importantly, they were well-written and both made by Netflix. Cuphead was also made by Netflix, which is an adaptation of a video game. But uh, I don't think anybody cares about Cuphead. And I say that these two are really good with no bias at all. I'd rather eat glass and blow my brains out than ever play League of Legends. Like, I've done a lot of wrong in my life. I played Star Wars roleplay on Gmod as a kid. But that's not as bad as playing League of Legends. There, there's levels to this. We all make dumbass decisions, but the amount of money I put into useless skins is fucking stupid. He's a fan. So what happened today was, you know, I, I woke up. And I've complained a lot about Cyberpunk and CD Projekt Red in a bunch of videos. So yeah, I ain't meat riding these games at all, which I think makes these shows better. Arcane and Edge Runners are good standalone pieces of media that could be enjoyed by people who don't care about his video game source material at all. Cause I'd rather lose all five of my fingers before I touch that piece of shit game. <laughs> And those shows being two large successes brings legitimacy to the realm of animated adaptations. But like a double-edged sword, their success also invites a lot of greed. Corporations most of the time see dollar signs when they see other things succeed. And right now as we speak, a lot of animation studios are eyeballing the landscape, wondering what would happen if I followed the same path. Cyberpunk got a huge boost because of Edge Runners, which gave it a massive second win. There's business to this. Make something good, connected to something bad, and everyone starts to believe that they're both good. It's a fucking disgrace. Everyone started a meme about Battlefield 2042 making an anime to save its game. And while it was a joke then, stuff like this is going to start happening. So in general, we're gonna start seeing a lot more game adaptations in the coming years. There's a bunch of films that have already been in the works for a while, like the Borderlands movie, the Bioshock movie, the Mario movie, with all three of those having a star cast. And many more movies with most likely star casting are going to be releasing as well. But it's still a coin toss of whether or not these projects end up good or complete trash. But a new realm of media is getting tapped into, which is live action television. The only way for the Edge Runners tactic to work is if that external piece of media is so well made and enjoyed that it persuades people to visit the source. And the biggest requirement for that is a good product.
<laughs> so let's talk about Halo. I am public enemy number one when it comes to Halo. If I saw you walking down the street, I'd fucking kill you. I'd kill your fucking kids. I'd kill your fucking wife. And I'd kill your fucking mom. Halo Infinite is the worst Halo game in its franchise. I ripped it apart once in a video, and since then, the game is still next to no new content while still lacking old content. But this is a Last of Us video, and we've been talking about adaptations, so watch that video if you want to know why that game sucks. Let's get back on track. I explained that the game had a bad development cycle due to its process being neglected since higher-ups were more interested in the TV show counterpart. And, yeah, the show was bad. Who would have thought the Halo show by Paramount was going to be bad? Me. I saw it from a mile away. Find the Halo. Win the war. This guy stinks! Just like the game, the people behind the show were corporate suits that saw money before quality. Halo. Everybody loved these Halos, so let's use this beloved IP to make a generic sci-fi show full of edgy baits like violence and nudity. I saw a chief blow up Halo rings when I was a kid, now your kids get to see his ass. And I mean literally see his ass. The people making the show were never involved with Halo. And the showrunner didn't even play or look at the games before making season one. They only looked at the character designs and world designs of the games. Take in mind that 343 stated that they were an open book to any questions that the showrunner could have potentially had. But the showrunner wasn't even a fan of Halo, so nothing mattered. It was pretty much doomed from the start. And because of it, it was terrible. Even as a standalone sci-fi project, it's really lackluster due to it being so poorly written. And on top of that, it's cheap looking without much of the stupid action that made its community of shills cry tears of joy when it first came out. You don't get that fan service every second. You instead get puddles of poor writing and bad world building. Don't get me wrong, having constant action is a horrible principle when there's bad writing, but that would have been way more enjoyable than this edgy plot with unnecessary nudity and violence. I'm not a square, by the way. I, I like violence and nudity in certain shows when it warrants it. But here I just sense so much cynicism. To the casket drops, I will play God. Fuck the world, let's start a right. <sighs> this is a video about The Last of Us. I know. But after how bad the Halo show was, and how bad Halo Infinite was, you have an announcement that The Last of Us is releasing a show coming out after a sequel to the first game that was very divisive in its own community. You also had the announcement that Pedro Pascal was playing Joel, which at the time looked like a situation of cast popular guy for more attention. They also casted Bella Ramsey, who looked nothing like Ellie, but unlike corporate cynicism for the guy who just came off The Mandalorian, people were ripping apart the facial features and potential insecurities of an 18 year old that never starred in a lead role. The announcement was full of toxicity and skepticism and for the skepticism it was justified even i was skeptical but then it was announced that the show would be on hbo made by neil Druckmann, who made the first game as well as craig mazin who made chernobyl which was really good which instantly made me go wait let these men cook and let's see what happens. Much like how I give A24 praise for their reputation of giving filmmakers creative freedom, I have a lot of trust in HBO when it comes to visual quality. HBO has a reputation of its originals not looking cheap. Sopranos, Game of Thrones, House of Dragon, and many more shows have a certain level of quality to their appearance, because HBO gives massive budgets to their projects. <laughs> Bingo! Since they expect to get massive returns. Which, in this case, yeah, it, it worked. The Last of Us even surpassed House of Dragon in views recently. It was a massive success. The Halo show looked ugly because it had a very low budget. The suits looked like they were made of plastic, the sets were barren, and the CGI was awful. Like this shot with the sliding CGI assault rifle that could have been practical. I say this, but when they did practical, they forgot to CGI as well. This was the first episode, by the way. But the more important thing, other than this being on HBO, was that the creative director and writer who made the first game was also making the show and next to him is craig mazin who was a fan of the first game and just made a really good show as well sony at some point sat down with craig and asked him if he wanted to adapt any playstation games which one would he want to do he asked why the last of us was not an option and it was stated that it was off the table due to the potential making of a film this film was never made due to disagreements in writing since neil found it impossible to fit the story in a at most three hour window which also put sam raimi out of a job may god rest his soul he had to make a mid ass Marvel movie. And sometime after Chernobyl came out, the adaptation rights for The Last of Us reverted back to Naughty Dog and Neil Druckmann. And hey, Neil Druckmann was a fan of Chernobyl, so him and Craig met each other and began chatting. And due to the success of Chernobyl, Craig had some connections at HBO. And since he just finished a project, that being Chernobyl, he now had some time on his hands to start something new. After I played The Last of Us, I was just in awe of the game. I was in awe of Neil. So I immediately want to meet Craig now that I've seen Chernobyl. You know, let's just assume we wanted to make this as a TV show at HBO. What would that look like? And he said, oh, it'd be very easy. 
we go across the street and we meet with them and I tell them I want that to be my next project and we make it my next project. He finishes the pitch and then uh, Casey stands up and he's like, well, Craig, I told you whatever your next project is has to make you float. This is clearly it. And they turn to me and he's like, it was a pleasure meeting you. Let's make this show. That was a snippet from episode one of the Last of Us podcast, which was released directly after every episode of the show. The podcast was hosted by Troy Baker, who was the voice actor of Joel from the video game. And in the podcast, he talked with Neil and Craig about every episode after they were released. And the two have been fully transparent about the show and how it was made, as well as the changes they made for television and how it compares to the video game, such as intentions within character writing. What I'm trying to explain by saying this is that these two are real people, not corporate suits that mainly care about getting good ratings and money off of something they know people love, like the Halo show. It's literally the guy who made the first game and a guy who was a fan of it. By all the behind the scenes footage you could find, it seems that everybody loved working on this. Even those who are involved with the video game are involved in the show, which shows that the creators aren't insecure about this existence. They're not trying to write out the video games and have this be on the main stage. They're instead trying to live up to its quality and coexist alongside it. All the minor things like this have a big impact, like how important roles were given to the voice actors from the first game, like Joel playing the cannibal guy who gets whacked by Ellie, Ellie playing Ellie's mom that gives birth to Ellie, Tommy playing a new guy that gets his head ripped in half. Hell, Marlene from the game gets to play Marlene in the show. Also, Abby from the second game is in the hospital scene at the end, which, hey, I know not everybody's a big fan. It's still cool that they put the voice actor in the show. And all of this gets us to the important explanation of this video's title. The Last of Us is the best video game adaptation by a mile so far. In the modern YouTube landscape, it's way more beneficial to be negative about something popular. Justified or not, people are interested to find a contrarian opinion to something they might agree or disagree with. But I find it really hard to rip this show limb for limb like some people have been. I have dislikes of the show and stuff that I prefer in the game for sure, and I'm gonna be talking about it, but I couldn't possibly see myself going the route that I've gone before with these videos, so I question how others could as well. But to first explain why this show is good, we need to talk about Craig Mazin and George Lucas. I truly believe that Craig Mazin is the reason why this show is not getting ripped apart. Neil Druckmann made the first game with Bruce Straley, who also helped with other Naughty Dog games like the Uncharted series, with his last project being Uncharted 4 Thief's End, where then after he cut ties with Naughty Dog, and this was most likely due to that Subway commercial. Hey, I'm Nathan Drake. Subway, where winners eat. What the fuck? Bruce helped co-create the world and characters for The Last of Us. He even came up with the whole cordyceps angle, but he wasn't there for The Last of Us 2. Neil Druckmann led The Last of Us 2, co-written by Haley Gross. Do you now see why we need to talk about George Lucas? The mind of George Lucas is a brilliant one. The prequels as a concept is awesome and genius. It's way better than the corporatized sequel era from Disney. But the original trilogy is also amazing as a concept, changing the perspective of sci-fi from being an aesthetic of 1950s silver woman to space cowboys, samurais, and uh, space n-words. I'm not being right. racist, just like the F word from earlier, I like money and don't want to get demonetized. But let's just say that the Empire might be similar to a group of people that didn't like another group of people in World War II, and Kanye West might be their leader. But the original trilogy wasn't only good because of its awesome ideas and world, they also just had some really good movies. I think people always forget that George Lucas is the co-creator of Indiana Jones, and that it's one of the very few projects by Lucasfilm that isn't Star Wars related. Also has Little Short Round who recently won an Oscar. Yes, 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 yes. You as well. <laughs> I love you as well, you son of a bitch. Also, Pixar was a part of Lucasfilm, which revolutionized the world of animation. But when his wife divorced him, he lost everything. So he had a. So he sold Pixar to Steve Jobs, who made Toy Story, then sold it to Disney. And then he died. This is the last of us video, by the way. The original trilogy and Indiana Jones are what they are because of George Lucas's pretty little mind and his counsel. The prequel trilogy films have a lot of flaws. Revenge of the Sith is usually the only one people tend to rewatch due to it being better than just its concept, unlike the two other movies. It's really good standalone. It's even one of the best Star Wars films ever. But the prequel trilogy as an entity in its entirety, even with these two stinker films, is amazing and has been used to make a ton of creative external Star Wars media. For example, clone troopers are boring. In 2005, that is. The Clone Wars show has given these literal clones unique and distinguished personalities, and it's molded my mind. So now when I see a clone trooper, I don't think of the boring white clone army. 
<laughs> Mormons be like. I instead think of Captain Rex, Commander Wolf, Republic Commandos, the 501st, 212th. I spend way too much money on Lego. So if George Lucas had a good counsel around him when he made these prequel films, there could have been small adjustments and better decisions to make these amazing ideas more cohesive. Neil Druckmann is George Lucas. Even if you like The Last of Us 2, you are in denial if you cannot concede that there are massive flaws. Not even subjective decisions of concept, like illiterate flaws that make no sense because of poor writing. Oh yeah, heads up by the way, massive Last of Us 2 spoilers for those who have only watched the show, skip to this immediately. You got like three seconds. I think Neil is an emotional guy who tends to think with his heart before his brain a lot. So while he thinks this ending is really cool with loads of themes and subtext that he's been laying out, I'm thinking, oh, these two don't really know anything about each other. It kind of makes no sense that they would react like this. Okay, like even the idea of Joel getting whacked isn't that bad. I'm okay with the character dying, but the way it's written disconnects me from the suspension of disbelief, which takes me away from the messaging that you're trying to make me feel. It now just feels like shock value. And in terms of that, it succeeded, I guess, but it could have had brutal shock value while also having good writing. This is why you need counsel and second opinions from creative people when you write stuff. You should have had a second or third opinion to point out little details like, why is Joel's sus radar not thrown off by multiple people in a very small place, especially since you don't know the intentions of why they're there yet. They could potentially be raiders who are scouting out Jackson, and to make it worse, you let yourself be cornered while giving out your name even though it has been written yet that Joel might have gone soft and lost his survival instincts, so it looks more like bad writing than intentional writing. And then Neil goes, oh yeah, that, that is kind of dumb. Uh, I still really like this idea though, so let's rewrite it to where it's impactful and makes sense. That's why you need Craig Mason. A video game and a TV show are not the same thing, so you gotta present stuff in different ways. Craig made a statement before the show came out and it made a lot of people upset. So outraged that they began to compare it to the Halo show's outrage, where the showrunner didn't even play the games. This statement was ripped apart in the most unfaithful, uncharitable, and moronic ways. And with hindsight, you see it was because gamers were defensive and up in arms about something that they didn't trust yet. But what Craig is saying is true. Some were so dense that they read it as, death in video games are impactful, but deaths in shows are. Which is not what he's saying at all. Comparisons are even made to the death of Sarah or main characters in other video games. Like in general. When in this context, he's talking about Stormtrooper-like NPCs. Spoiler again for The Last of Us 2, skip here, but The Last of Us 2 was watered down because of its ludonarrative dissonance. Ludonarrative dissonance is, well, okay. Nakey Jakey explained it well, pretty much the difference of gameplay versus narrative. Here's how he explains it. It's a term used to describe a situation where the story being told during gameplay conflicts with the story being told during cutscene. Thank you, Jacob. I really appreciate you doing my job for me, you sweet little prince. Mwah. Games have to be engaging, and because of that, Joel gets to blast off legs and kill tons of people and zombies, but it reduces these people to not feel like real in-depth guys, but rather stormtroopers that you get to mangle for your own enjoyment. So death and violence is no longer shocking. They tried to fix this in The Last of Us 2 by having the stormtroopers call each other by real names, but all it did was make me know that it was Dylan who got his jaw ripped off by my rifle. And, uh, Charlie? Yeah, um, that guy could go straight to hell. It's still really fun, don't get me wrong, especially in The Last of Us 2 where you only get to do it for three hours before you have to do boring bullshit. But, yeah, having all this fun definitely numbs you to the chaos. The Last of Us 2 would actually be way better as a TV show because the ludonarrative dissonance ruins a lot of the gut punches that they're trying to insert in the show. Like Ellie crying over the death of a pregnant lady when, for the last couple of days, she's been on a bloodlust rampage. Or Abby not killing the pregnant lady that helped kill all of her friends when, for the last couple of days, she's been on a bloodlust rampage. So, for the last of the show, Craig and Neil had to make some changes in the lab to make this baby boy good for your living room. Maybe it's not good for your living room though, because episode 3 definitely led to some people getting beat. The show can't just be a constant shooting gallery, so this makes death in the show way more impactful than in the game, which is a great change for TV. In game, it's sick when I blast an NPC's head off, because he's an NPC that I don't care about. I'm gonna do it a bunch more times later. But someone dies in the show, it's a big deal because it doesn't happen a lot. For people who haven't played the game yet, there's a new tension that wasn't present in the game. Joel can't respawn, so if he messes up, it will affect the show, which it does. And even if he succeeds, it still has effects. During the car crash fight, Joel had to execute someone that was trying to kill him. This person was scared and pleading for his life to then be finished off by Joel. And this death really had an impact on Ellie, Joel, 
and the audience because so far at that point they have only seen Joel be violent a couple of times. This also applies to the infected in the show. The clicker reveal displayed something that was never in the game before, which was a very whorish cinematic presentation, in correlation to something like the Jurassic Park kitchen scene with the velociraptors. Clickers in game are an obstacle for the player to have fun with within a sandbox, with the gimmick being that the clickers can't see you, but they can hear you very well. So it creates a fun in game puzzle where you have to find a way to sneak up on them, but in the show they aren't a puzzle because everyone would get pissed off after the 10th broken bottle. This change leads to a new element of visual horror, causing distress since basic human panic and mishandling could be the difference between life and death if a character is bitten. Tess, Riley, and most of all Sam's death are especially tragic now since it's more believable that they might have got scared and made said mistakes from said fear that cost them their lives. Whereas when I'm Ellie, I'm bobbing and weaving everything like I'm fucking Rocky. But then you got Abby who's just straight up bare knuckle fighting. Infected in general are way more intimidating in the show than they ever were in the game. Let's compare this to the best zombie show of all time, The Walking Dead. I'm joking, that show sucks besides its first couple of seasons. The infected were once scary in that, but through repetition of killing them over and over again, they lost their intimidation, so when someone died from them, it felt kind of stupid and unbelievable. The zombies act more like animals than an infection that wants to win. So when infected come in waves against a faction, it turns into a video game. But since it's not interactive, it gets boring fast. The infected in The Last of Us are brutal. You are not winning against this horde. And it's intentional to add urgency and pressure to the idea of the world potentially being saved. But it makes total sense why people think that this world is truly screwed. The episode 5 conflict with the infected was a terror that you never got to experience in the games. Even when I saw the Rat King in part 2, my first thought was, ooh, fun boss fight. And I was more in awe of its design rather than being afraid by its presence. This is terrifying. It wipes out everyone in the span of a couple of minutes. You can't just slowly stab them all to death with crowd control like The Walking Dead. If Tess didn't make a distraction, Ellie and Joel would have definitely died. Infected and humans are a serious threat in the show. Not to say that they aren't presented as a threat in the video games as well, but since it's a video game where you need to kill stuff to have fun, it loses shock value but instead becomes enjoyable for a different reason. That being it's fun to kill people and set them on fire. The emotional outrage to Craig's statements represents how a lot of people were toward the show and its changes. In general, change is really scary, but change isn't always bad. And sometimes change could lead to stuff that's better or different than what there was before. Like, Craig changing Tessa's death is actually a good thing. Before, it made no sense that Fedra would be that far from the QZ searching for two runaways who most likely would have died if it wasn't Joel and Tess, or how the Jackson Raider segment was random and out of nowhere for the sake of a gameplay segment. And for some instances, Craig and Neil wanted to change some characters completely, which we'll talk about in a bit. But something else they did was changes to presentation. Since Craig and Neil don't want shooting gallery presentation, it now has to replace that void with something else. And while the show loses some violence and action, it now has to focus on the world building and character building. It's levels, it's layers, so pray for the players, uh. Vegas is a very ugly place. The only interesting display of world building you have here is construction and the drunk homeless people who like to go searching for ants. But unlike Vegas, The Last of Us is pretty, and that beauty makes this fallen world very rich, with great sets and prop work that help make the world actually look like it's been abandoned and lived in for the past 20 years. They went so above and beyond that during the winter segments they filmed everything on location, so all the actors have frozen and red little cheeks and are breathing out cold air constantly. It's so much cooler than building an artificial winter set. Somebody please get this man a gun. And I know it's probably re really annoying for the cast and crew because they're freezing their asses off, but God, does it look nice. Other annoying stuff for the team was doing a bunch of practical work with a good mix of very well-made CGI. Every time you get to see an infected in the show, they all look stunning and not cheap like a certain other show. Since they were practical for the most part, having an actor be in makeup for countless amount of hours, including the bloater. Also, I'm gonna give a diss to my friend Typo. We had a bet on the giraffe in episode nine before it came out, if it was gonna be CGI or not. And it was practical, it, it was a real giraffe. They touched a real giraffe and and that's really cool. And I was also right, so that's the biggest part. I win. And the development of this entire world is done very well. It can even at times be better than its source material since the game is restricted by its player interactivity. And to translate that to English instead of speaking 4i for the non-gamers out there, when you play The Last of Us, no matter what, you have to follow either Ellie or Joel, whether it be in a cutscene or through gameplay. I guess a 14-year-old girl can take a bullet like that. And you go, my stomach hurts, I ate MMM. 
Yeah, literally. <laughs> And it has to be like this because cutting to someone completely different that isn't a playable character is re really jarring in a video game. That's no shade to The Last of Us 2, by the way, in case anyone thinks that I might be throwing shade that way. In that game, it's a perspective swap. It's literally a perspective change where Abby becomes the main protagonist for 10 hours. A good narrative example is going from Arthur to John and from John to Jack. Yeehaw! If Joel and Jelly, Joel and Jelly, if at the end of the game Joel and Ellie were together and then we go to a cutscene with Tommy and Maria back in Jackson to then go back to Ellie and Joel talking about wanting to go to Jackson, it would be really odd and would kill some of the immersion. In a video game, you should always have the character you are playing be in frame to a capacity. And through that character, you could explore the world that the character lives in yourself. <sighs> It's something that the video game does really well. Replaying it recently, I enjoy just walking around and seeing pretty landscapes. But since we're a show now, we get to leave the perspectives of Joel and Ellie, and sometimes we could be both of their perspectives with other people that aren't each other at the same time. When Joel talks to Tommy, in-game Ellie goes to Maria to get food, and we don't get to see that interaction. But in the show, we get to see Tommy with Joel, as well as Ellie with Maria, at the same time, since we're no longer restricted to one perspective. And not being limited to a perspective can help flesh out characters that aren't protagonists, as well as the world that these side characters live in since we're now able to see it through a whole new set of eyes. In episode one, we open with an intro that explains flat out to everyone that if one day mushrooms want smoke with us, it's a wrap. Then in episode two, we get to see a scientist from a whole different continent, that being the city of Jakarta in Southeast Asia. Jakarta, where is that Middle East? Examine in the start of the virus where she states that the only solution is to bomb the city so you can keep it under control for a little bit. Bomb. Hi, Red. This is world building of the cordyceps infection, and it solidifies that the world, not just the United States, is truly doomed, which adds more desperation to the idea of a potential vaccine, making this journey more important while adding extra tension and controversy to its ending. In that same episode, we also get to see the perspective of Joel's daughter, Sarah, outside of where the game starts, and she goes into the outside world showing what life was like right before the outbreak. And since the show's in 2023, we had to go back to 2003 in a post-9-11 world with good old G. Bush. Sadly, we don't find out if he hates black people or not. George Bush doesn't care about black people. Don't care. Later in the show, it also explains that the virus was present in the food supply, which caused it to spread. And in the episode, it shows all the bullets that were dodged by being irresponsible while showing how it affected the responsible people who do eat breakfast. But like, for real, it shows everything. They didn't have pancake mix. Where's the pancake mix? Oh, was that? Yeah, it was. Sorry. I thought we was having pancakes. Sarah turns down the cookies from her neighbors twice. Y'all want some biscuits? I do, but I'm on Atkins. I should go. You sure? Yeah. Well, you're taking some cookies. And Joel forgets to get himself a birthday cake. I'll bring back a cake. I promise. Where's the cake? Come on, man. I'll get us one tomorrow. All these decisions led to them not getting infected that night. Even later, it shows that the neighbor's mother fell to the infection from that tainted food supply from the hospitals within the city. It could have possibly took longer for it to hit shelves in other places, and those places might have been dodged by Joel not caring about breakfast. <laughs> as well as his birthday. God, he really is just like me for real. The attention to detail is crazy and requires later context to notice it, but little details like these are scattered throughout the entire show. In episode four, Craig explains the thought process behind Joel killing the kid with a knife. It was to conserve ammo and not be loud. In episode five, we see Sam use an Etch-A-Sketch because paper and pencils would be extremely limited in that world. It establishes that dogs could smell infection in episode one. That leads to a tense moment in episode six. And in episode eight, we see Ellie empty the rounds of a rifle on the floor while still holding David and Jim hostage. A subtle smart detail that has no payoff, but is still realistic. These subtle details help rich in the characters in the setting of an apocalypse. There's not a lot of ammo. The gas does still exist, but is really watered down, which means they have to stop for it constantly. And dried out jerky and 20 year old Chef Boyardee is pretty much the diet that most people would have. Beefaroni, Chef Boyardee. And these details add up over time and show the observation and care made toward the small things that most people wouldn't even notice or seek out. The open perspective made Sarah a better character and made The Last of Us more expansive. And this is present all throughout the show. You learn more about Fedra and the inner workings inside the wall. You see how bad the Fireflies are actually struggling while also seeing how they got in possession of Ellie. How violent the liberation of the Kansas QZ was. How intense being the subject of a citywide manhunt can be. How children under Fedra grow up. The inner workings of a pragmatist cannibal cult with a falling leader that everyone resents, and a functional communist safe haven full of sheep and movie nights. You also get a day in my life vlog starring two gay guys because you can now see stuff that the protagonist can't see. Oh yeah, also Frank is alive, Henry's a coward, and Sam is deaf. What's your name, girlfriend? What's your name? 
The change of these characters are interesting to say the least. The, the changes in writing, I mean, not their appearance. This is gonna ruin some of your guys' parasocial views on good old Dr. Skipper, but here it goes, everyone. I don't hate black people. I don't hate Mexican people. And I don't give a single shit about race swapping. When you talk about a character, talk about a character. There were grown men with tons of Funko Pops who looked like the whale but didn't have the heart of Charlie getting mad that Sarah was black, Maria was black, Joel was Hispanic, and that someone playing a 14-year-old girl was not hot like the video game, which, um, what the fuck does that even mean? A cupcake? You'll notice one major change immediately, that Sarah is now black. What does this add to the show? Why, absolutely nothing. Could make the argument that it's here to make us care more about Sarah, but I really didn't. Partially because of the race swap. And the problem is not that she's a terrible actress. I honestly think she was just fine here. It's just that her face is so fucking distracting. I don't know if she has fetal alcohol syndrome or Down syndrome, but she certainly has some issue of some kind. She doesn't look like a normal human being. Um, that was, a. Uh... That was really bad. And look, I know how this might sound to some. It's easy to claim that people are grifters and incels when they don't like something that others like. But some of the people bitching about this show are just genuinely hateful with semi-large platforms. And when people have these preconceived ideas, they use it to attack other problems that are non-existent. Like the claim that Pedro Pascal was a wooden board with no talent, even though he showed great range many times in various episodes. What town? It's all I've ever done. Or that Bella Ramsey was a bad casting choice due to her being distracting because of how ugly she is? Which, it has no relevancy and is extremely fucked up to state as a criticism, especially from grown men that whine and piss about stupid minimal shit. So just one last time I'll go over these wokeness changes if you're curious. Notable one, the one you've likely seen, is the all-gender bathroom. Get a goddamn job! And we haven't even talked about Bill and Frank, which... <laughs> God. We'll, we'll, we'll get to, but Pedro Pascal's little Mexican face, Bella Ramsey's not sexualized face for degenerates, and whatever whatever's faces, all did a great job in the show, with many good performances and impressive displays of acting. So now let's talk about the characters, since that's what is most important. Pedro and Bella were instructed to not play the video games before shooting or while shooting the show, and some thought this was another Halo situation, but it wasn't. It was a good change to help with the show's identity. The best parts of the show was when it swayed from being an adaptation and focused on being its own standalone thing. If if Pedro and Bella were told to be Ashley and Troy, you would have just had a watered down copycat version of the characters since it's impossible to live up to the same expectations of the original. Troy and Ashley's performance have their own little quirks and sets of improv that you can't get naturally if instructed to copy something else to a perfection. Joel calling Sarah baby girl, which he eventually calls Ellie later in a crucial moment, was completely improvised. Some of the worst parts of the show was when they tried to recreate scenes from the game because while being faithful, it sometimes felt unnatural since Joel and Ellie didn't have the same time to develop as the characters in the video game. The Last of Us game does not have an open perspective, and because of this you are going to be around Joel and Ellie a lot, which gives them a lot of time to develop and build chemistry, so when big events happen, it's really impactful. That's too small of a grave. I forgot to leave that stupid robot on his grave. What should I do with it? Ellie. What? I want to talk about it. No. Why not? How many times do we need to go over this? Things happen, and we move on. It's just... That's enough. Right. Joel and Ellie's fight was better in the game by far. It's a better performance, the context is stronger, and it's more emotional. Tommy knows this area. Oh, better fuck than that. Well, I'm sorry. I trust him better than I trust myself. Stop with the bullshit. What are you so afraid of? That I'm going to end up like Sam? I can't get infected. I can take care of myself. How many close calls have we had? Well, we seem to be doing all right so far. And now you'll be doing even better with Tommy. I made this decision for your own good. You'll be way better off with Tommy. He knows the area better than I do. Do you give a shit about me or not? Of course I do. Then what are you so afraid of? I'm not her, you know. What? Maria told me about Sarah. Ellie! And... You are treading on some mighty thin ice here. I'm not her, you know. Maria told me about Sarah and... No. Don't say another word. I'm sorry about your daughter, Joel, but I have lost people too. You have no idea what loss is. I'm sorry about your daughter, Joel, but I have lost people too. You have no idea what loss is. Everyone I have cared for has either died or left me. Everyone fucking except for you. Everybody I have cared for has either died or left me. Everybody fucking except for you! 
and while it's passable in the show, the dialogue and scene all together should have just been adjusted and tweaked for Pedro and Bella's version since they aren't the same as Ashley and Troy's. It's what happened with Tess's death and that's why it was really good in this adaptation. It wasn't a one for one recreation but instead something of its own that could be judged that way. An adaptation doesn't need to be a retelling completely. The cute and lovable Pedro Pascal has been put into a weird situation with a character that he has to fill the shoes of. Pedro Pascal's cute little Joel is, is not Joel, it's a new Joel. And I won't lie, at first I was not a fan of this Joel because I was comparing him one-to-one -one with the Joel that I love. And as each episode would pass, I felt that they ruined his character, making him overly soft and incompetent. But then I realized later that this is a complete reimagine of that same character where he's supposed to be soft and incompetent. Troy Baker's Joel is a violently blunt guy who speaks straight up most of the time while not fearing any confrontation. <laughs> But at the same time, this is still the Joel we've known since 2013. The same guy that has that protective dad instinct and will kill anyone for the people he loves most. I'll show you. This Joel is not like that. Pedro's Joel has the same events happen to him. He loses his daughter and just like the game, it's heart-wrenching and extremely emotional. But the Joel we get moving forward has a new spin to him. Instead of a man who is mad at the world, full of violence and rage, pushing back against a new child figure in his life with a coldness to not let in those feelings, we instead have a man who is capable of violence, but is also plagued by regret and insecurity, being both aimless and ambitious while having empathy and consideration for people in the world around him. Put the gun down. Slide it over to me. Please don't do it. Please. We see Joel cradling his dead child, then go 20 years in the future where he has to burn the body of a recently dead child since his co-worker can't stomach to do it. Showing that Joel is numb to this new world, with his only purpose being to hustle for a car battery so that he can attempt to find the only family he has left. And while doing this, he isn't alone. He's met someone in this new world to share this burden with, yet he's still aimless. And at the same time, we're introduced to a little girl chained up in the same episode who is aggressive and impatient. In the game, the first time we meet Ellie is when Joel meets Ellie due to the game perspective thingy we talked about earlier, but it makes sense to flesh out this kid around the same time as Joel since the time we'll see them together is much more limited than the game. Ellie in the game was a kid who didn't know how cruel the world was and was more fascinated by its beauty, questioning if that beauty is also everywhere else. You know, I've never been this close to the outside. Look how dark it is. Can't be any worse out there. Can it? And throughout the game, she learns firsthand about how bad that beautiful world really is. But on this journey, she's accompanied by someone who is heavily damaged, but is very experienced. And through the journey of the game, she has to learn to be resourceful, independent, and reliable. While also falling in love with the idea of a parent figure being in her life for the first time ever. While that parent figure is standoffish about the same love of being a dad with purpose again. Look, I'm not supposed to tell you why you're smuggling me, if that's what you're getting at. You wanna know the best thing about my job? I don't gotta know why. To be honest with you, I give two shits what you're up to. Well, great. Good. And through the game, she slowly starts to peel back his layers, and slowly Joel starts to let down his walls. Ellie in the show is more codependent than game Ellie. She's not able to function in this world without Joel, which puts more pressure on Joel since in this world he's not as confident or resilient as the video game counterpart. <laughs> But Ellie is also delusional, with an extreme false sense of confidence about the world she lives in due to her childish immaturity. Ellie in the game is not used to violence and is frightened by it. She's afraid of it the first couple times when she's introduced to it. Oh my God! And throughout the game, she is slowly more traumatized by it, and she sees how bad shit could really get. Jeez. I guess this is how it ended for this zone. Well, every battle's got a losing side. What if they had families? Everyone has a family. Best not to dwell on it. Not. Whereas the show Ellie is fascinated by the idea of survival and craves to be a strong violent survivor. Video game Ellie is shocked when Joel makes a guy shoot himself in the head with his own gun, much like in the show when Sarah is shocked by Joel killing their infected neighbor. But show Ellie is fascinated by Joel's violence as he punches the man he used to sell perk 30s to, uh, to death. He punches him to death and she chooses to observe it like a baby T-Rex from Jurassic Park the, the Lost Jeez, Geez, man, I, I, there's so many references to Jurassic Park in this video. And through the show, we see these two character traits expand and regress. That being insecurity and failure for Joel and the loss of child innocence, as well as immaturity for Ellie. While Joel Miller in the video game is displayed to be hell on wheels, TV show Joel is shown many times to be incompetent 
and sloppy, making simple mistakes while also freezing up time to time. And as Joel makes these mistakes, the more insecure he gets about being able to protect this child that he's taken the responsibility of, while also fearing the emotions of losing a kid all over again like he did with Sarah, a thought that he hasn't had to worry about for 20 years. And these thoughts plague him, riddling him with anxiety, causing panic attacks left and right, as well as waves of nostalgia and regret for what he could have if he succeeded at protecting the ones he loved. And at the same time, Ellie is full of immaturity, believing that she has what it takes to survive in this dangerous world, and is fascinated by being a survivor like Joel. We see her explore this fascination, carving into trapped infected with her knife to then plunge the blade in its skull, where then later she steals a gun that she's not supposed to have, and like the child she is, she poses with it, imagining herself having to use that gun in a broken mirror with her reflection looking back, thinking of herself being just like Joel. But when she actually has to use this weapon to save the life of Joel, who just got himself stuck in a life or death situation, she does. And at that moment, she comes to grip with reality quickly, realizing that she just attempted to kill somebody and that she's not the Wild West gunslinger who dropped the bad guy, but that she just shot someone who was alive and didn't finish the job. And now that person is in pain, crying while pleading for their life. And it freaks her out, snapping her out of this delusion while also bringing her to tears. It's a loss of innocence and a loss of confidence. This type of delusion is common within children. We just call it imagination since we're not in a clicker fungus zombie apocalypse. It's like when you watch Transformers as a kid and you thought you could rip people's arms and heads off like Optimus Prime, or how you thought that if you let a spider bite you, that you too could be Spider-Man. And that kid bubble was just popped and she doesn't enjoy what just happened. And at the same time, it makes Joel feel like a failure all over again. In the game, the sequence is very different. Tess is infected and before making a sacrifice, she makes one last request to Joel to promise her to get Ellie to the Fireflies to find a cure. Joel is skeptical of this and later verifies this immunity through Ellie being able to breathe in spores. So with this confirmation and motivation, he goes and visits an old friend named Bill for a truck which develops the trust issues of Joel and Ellie. Throughout the whole segment, Ellie fights for Joel's validation and wants to be seen as reliable and trustworthy. And at the same time, Joel wants to shut this kid out as nothing but a job, not wanting to accept her as someone who could be more in his life than just cargo. Jam from the other side. Here, boost me up. No, that's not such a good idea. Well, I can't boost you up. How else are we gonna open it? No, just open it. Nothing else. <clears throat> okay. Ta-da! Let me use that. I'm a pretty good shot with that thing. How about we just leave this kind of stuff to me? Well, we could both be armed. Cover each other. I don't think so. Uh-uh. What? I need a gun. No, you don't. Joel, I can handle myself. No. Tie it on the other side. What about going through here? What, the doggy door? Maybe you should have given her a gun. Okay, Bill. And as him and Ellie have to rely on each other more and more and protect each other from this constant danger, he slowly starts to give in and begins to slowly rely more on this kid. But when they're just about to arrive at that finish line, he still closes her out. Later, when Joel is put into position of life and death, Ellie breaks his order of staying put and takes his gun to save his life. Expecting validation and praise, Ellie is instead rewarded with bitterness and aggression as Joel doubles down, not wanting to admit that this kid is someone he can't rely on. And you just hang back like I told you to. Well, you're glad I didn't, right? I'm glad I didn't get my head blown off by a goddamn kid. You know what? No. How about, hey, Ellie, I, I know it wasn't easy, but it was either him or me. Thanks for saving my ass. You got anything like that for me, Joel? We gotta get going. But full of guilt, he drops the act right after and gives Ellie a test of trust while thanking her for saving his life. You stay here. This is so stupid. We'd have more of a fucking chance if you let me help. I am. If I get into trouble down there, you make every shot count. Yeah. I got this. And just so we're clear about back there, it was either him or me. You're welcome. Where she's then rewarded with a weapon, making her now a partner instead of a damsel in distress. The scene in the show is different. Due to the change of the Bill and Frank segment, this development is non-existent. And Ellie, as a character, is codependent. She's not really a partner at all. What we have instead is Joel flat out stating the mindset in the car instead of having that whole development period. Keep going for family. I'm not family. No. Your cargo. 
The change to Joel and Ellie is that Joel kills the person that Ellie shot to relieve Ellie of that situation, and Ellie hides while crying. Joel is full of regret and feels guilty given that he just messed up at protecting this kid by almost getting himself killed, which forced Ellie to intervene and shoot this guy, and he feels even more guilty since she's just a kid that shouldn't have been put in the situation in the first place. And while Ellie is still sad by what just happened, Joel gives her the blessing to carry the same gun she stole earlier and it lifts up her spirit like an actual child. When I was a kid I used to stay up late playing video games when I knew I wasn't supposed to, but when I got that permission directly to play NW3 till 10 o'clock at night, it made that session 10 times more enjoyable since I didn't have that guilt in the back of my mind. Stuff like this made the show really interesting since it's still the same events as the game, but now with a unique twist that makes it more than just a live action video game cutscene that happens to have the Mandalorian in it. As you can see, these are two completely different retellings of the same characters with the same names. A lot of the changes in the show from its source material were really impactful as standalone things. Most of the best parts of the show was when they diverted from the games and chose to be original. While the bedroom conversation felt awkward in episode 7 due to the character building not being the same as the game, making it much weaker, Joel breaking down with Tommy about how much of a failure he is is extremely emotional, while also still being original. That scene solidified Pedro's Joel as Pedro's Joel for me. It's his own character now, and I'm happy they stuck with that personality and doubled down rather than it being wishy-washy, dipping its toe in and taking it out, kind of like <laughs> the accent he tries to do from time to time. Rule three, you do what I say when I say it. We clear? You're sitting there like a fucking baboon! <laughs> My other favorite parts from the show is when Joel and Ellie just settled down and talked. Since a video game is a video game, Joel and Ellie are killing people from sunrise to sunset. No sleeping, eating, using the bathroom, none of it. Except for the, the nap, the nap, and almost dirt nap throughout the whole winter. Other than that though, no rest for the wicked. But since Pedro Pascal is a real person with a real face and a real bladder, he needs his full eight hours and a potty break. So you have multiple moments where they just set up camp and just talk. Either it be about the future, their current dynamic, or just simply telling stupid jokes. Another good change of originality is that some characters from the game were re-envisioned for television. Henry and Sam were rewritten for the show and it works very well. In the game, Henry and Sam were pretty much an exact copy of the Joel and Ellie dynamic, and Craig Mazin said that following the perspective of clone characters would be repetitive and boring, since it's just the same dynamic with different people who are temporary as it is. So he changed it to where Henry is no longer Joel, but instead a guy who has no combat experience. And for Sam, they didn't make him the same age as Ellie anymore, but rather a much younger kid who is now deaf. And instead of trying to escape the hunters in the city like the game, they rewrote the conflict being that Henry sold out his rebellion leader, that was also his friend Defedra, to get medicine for his brother's leukemia, screwing over his own people for the protection of the one he loves most. And when the rebellion wins the QZ, the sister of the rebellion leader takes command and wants Henry and Sam dead. If there's a creator in this world, he was professionally hating when making this kid. First he's deaf in a zombie apocalypse, which is really not helpful, but also cancer? Jesus Christ, bro, what the fuck? But like Joel and Ellie's dynamic, Henry is trying to preserve the innocence of Sam, while also having to protect him at the same time. And eventually Sam finds Joel and Ellie by Joel's negligence of sleeping on the wrong side, rather than Joel stumbling on them in the game and getting the upper hand to then concede when Sam draws his gun. Henry asks them to help get him and his brother out the city. Henry doesn't have Joel's combat experience, but like him, he has someone he needs to take care of, but what Henry has that Joel doesn't is city knowledge. Later Sam is infected, and in parallel to Ellie, she is also an innocent kid who shares her secret with Sam, hoping that her blood could save him. And in the morning when it doesn't, Henry kills Sam to protect Ellie, making his first kill ever be his own brother to protect another innocent kid, where he then shortly realizes that all the bad stuff he has done was for nothing since he failed to keep the one he loved most safe. Not able to deal with the trauma of the situation, he takes his life in front of both Joel and Ellie, which leads to another original parallel. That being that Joel attempted to kill himself just one day after her passing, and that failed attempt left him disabled, which is now affecting the safety of this new kid, making him feel even more guilty. And after seeing what just happened to Henry and relating to it, he's now in a position that he's never wanted to be in again with his child, making him more desperate to get to Tommy and have him take the burden away. The change of Henry and Sam is better than the game. It was changed and I preferred it. And I feel like it would even translate it very well to a video game, since in the game you still have some like better Joel and Ellie development, like the waterfall jump or her refusing to leave Joel's side. If they added the same deaths to the hunters as the rebels and adjust to Sam and Henry, it could have possibly been the best mission in the game. So with that, <laughs> let's talk about Villain Frank. Now, I think there's a problem with episode three. But Skipper, why? Why do you think there's a problem with this episode? It's because Bill and Frank are gay. There, I said it. They are gay and I can't stand it. All right, all right. 
We got it out of our system. We wiggled it out. Once again, snipping that parasocial bond. Bill and Frank being gay is not a problem with this episode. Them being gay is not an evil character flaw or a selfish character flaw or whatever some of these losers online are saying. The problem I have with this episode has nothing to do with that. It is radical, it is disgusting, and fuck anyone who thinks of that way. I, that, I do not want you in my audience, it's weird. The problem I have with this episode is that it's a waste of time because it's gay. Episode three of The Last of Us is a really good episode of television. And while it has some really bad action scenes, like Bill shooting in the street when he's shown to be a doomsday prepper, that would have totally built a sniper's nest, I, okay, whatever. It's still a good episode. And the whole love story in the apocalypse is really cute and wholesome. It reminded me of like the first five minutes from Up. I really liked it. And I enjoyed it as a standalone thing. But in the season of The Last of Us, um, it points out a glaring problem with this show. The Last of Us was originally 10 episodes long, but they mashed episodes one and two together for the sake of a good pilot, so it actually ended up being nine episodes in total. And for those nine episodes, one of them has to set up the world really well and focus not so much on Joel and Ellie's adventures, but rather setting up the foundations. And another episode is about one-off characters that die, and another episode is about an origin story that was a DLC in the game. And now you have open perspectives in all the other episodes, so a lot of minutes are getting eaten up by external characters. Also, most episodes aren't even an hour long, and the ending is super short compared to the rest. So with that all combined, it means that we don't get to see Joel and Ellie develop as much as they could have. And when they get to, it now has to be rushed so they could follow the order of events from the game. And at the same time, the show was really allergic to fun, so it made some of these rushed moments lack intensity and scale. The Bill section in the game is really good outside of just its combat, because while having Bill show up as a character, it also has Joel and Ellie right alongside him. Like I said earlier, the whole development for Ellie in this segment was her trying to prove herself to Joel as more than just cargo. But for Joel, a message was also being told at the same time. While Ellie is trying to earn Joel's trust and prove that she can be useful and reliable. At the same time, Joel is shutting himself off and being extremely blunt and harsh. I just want to say I'm sorry about Tess. That's it. I, I won't bring it up again. Ellie. You don't need to worry about me. But when he meets Bill, he sees that while having nobody to care for is the best way to survive, Bill is also not living at all. He's a toxic, sad, and angry person that has nothing to live for. And that survival mindset drove the only person who loved him away, which led to their death. And now Bill is an aimless ghost surviving in isolation, but for what? Joel sees this and relates to Bill, since recently he also just lost his partner. And being in the same position, Joel does not want to survive like Bill. And given what happens in part two, Bill is objectively correct. His way of survival is the most effective. But is this constant misery and loneliness while having no purpose worth the safety and survival in comparison to living a purposeful life while protecting someone who is more deserving of life than yourself? And throughout the whole segment, we see Joel reflect on this multiple times. You should have it. That's how you feel. Well, fuck you too, Frank. <sighs> Fucking idiot. You want to be okay with this? Yeah, not a problem. You're doing a good job. I figured you should know that. I won't let you down with this. The only important part of episode three in the show is the start and finish. It's the only part that's going to carry weight for the rest of the show going forward. That being that Ellie is kind of an asshole and is pushing back the same coldness Joel is giving, which is different from the game where Ellie has a lot more remorse for Tess's death, which makes this counterpart more immature. Look, I've been thinking about- I want your sorry. I wasn't going to say I'm sorry. I was going to say that I've been thinking about what happened. Nobody made you or Tess take me. Nobody made you go along with this plan. You needed a truck battery or whatever, and you made a choice. So don't blame me for something that isn't my fault. This guy stinks! And that Joel's reminded that he's a failure for the death of Tess, while also learning that he can find purpose. And that while Bill was at first a selfish and miserable asshole, he found a person that was worth living for, and above all, protecting the ones you love matter most. And this is all left in a death note. No, 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 not that kind of death note, but just a normal note that they get when they visit. And by doing that, you now left a whole episode of potential world building, character building, and fun set pieces that's relevant to our main characters to just an intro note. And you have a whole side quest that has n no relevance but to get to that note. It's a 30 second payoff that 
could have been expanded on if they stuck to the source material. Episode 5 and 8 different from the game, but still involved Joel and Ellie heavily. But episode 3 Seven. taking almost two hours of vital Ellie. progression means that everything else in the show now has to be rushed to stay on time. And since now everything has to be rushed, the show has to compromise fun to tell its story. I still stand by my statement earlier that every episode doesn't need to be a shooting gallery since it's a non-interactive TV show. Like, the Jackson change from the Hydro Plant was better since Raiders attacking the Hydro Plant was solely for gameplay reasons. But three minutes worth of infected in the whole season is crazy. Like, come on, that's that's a bit lame. After playing the game again on PC, I was reminded that a lot of the reason why The Last of Us story is so good is because how intense and fun it could be. Joel and Ellie's relationship is strengthened a lot from survival and protecting one another in life and death circumstances, which is a really good bonding experience. And for the sake of TV, it makes sense why everyone's favorite episode was episode 5. While it's cool to see Pedro kill a bunch of soldiers to rescue a child he once didn't care about to then threaten the doctor to unplug the kid while taking him unconscious to then exit and shoot the person that got you that kid in the, in the, in the first place. Wait, what the hell? It's not going to make normies get excited. In any show, you can see humans get shot a bunch of times, but not every show has fungus monsters that rip people apart. Mom and grandma want to see this. Susan from work want to see this. Everyone wants to see this, and there should have been more of it. You don't even need a bunch of clickers and bloaters that have a lot of makeup if that's the problem. Runners are really interesting as they are. In the game, they're portrayed really well, displaying that there's still somebody behind those eyes. <laughs> as they cry and scream and gurgle at, while they rip people apart as the fungus hijacks their nervous system, forcing them to do so. It's brutal. Now, if you replace episode 3 with the source material, then you get some cool action, you get some cool set pieces, you get good character development, a bunch of cool Ellie and Bill scenes. Now, do that, but make the show 12 episodes instead of 9. And now you get to have the cool gay love story, and Frank could die at the end, and Bill could be mad at the world and have the same cool episode as the game. Win, 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 and win, touchdown. Extending the show means that you could put more fun and more infected, which would have impacted the show in its world building. Joel gunning down people trying to save humanity would have been impactful no matter what. So him only killing one dude in five seconds at the college was really underwhelming, especially compared to the game where that segment was another case of Ellie proving that she can be independent and resourceful just before having to take care of Joel for the winter. Or the David episode could have had a little more intensity from both Ellie and Joel, but they had to rush it to stay on track. It's a lose-lose. You have to rush character development and you don't get to have as much fun action. If every episode had the same length as the pilot, it would have been way more beneficial for the show. Or if you made the show 12 episodes, you could have kept the left behind bit and the Bill and Frank stuff and still have Joel and Ellie get a lot of time together. And the finale should have been the same length as the pilot as well. I don't want Joel killing people for 40 minutes, but what I do want is more scenes like Joel talking about his suicide or Ellie being nervous or seeing Joel scared when he's about to lose the thing he loves most. <laughs> That being said, The Last of Us is still a really good adaptation. Is it better than the game? No. The Last of Us was built specifically for the video game medium, and that player interactivity allows the game to be way more rich and expressive, down to its world interaction, character writing, performances, and many other aspects that make it the best video game of all time to some. But I don't really like the idea of putting the show down because it's not as good as the game. To be better than the game is an impossible task that was never going to be completed. The Last of Us, though, without the knowledge of the game, is still a roller coaster story about a father learning to love again, and a daughter learning to be loved as they go through through trial and chaos to get there. And as a standalone adaptation, it's one of the best right now. Certainly the best live action one. And the important thing about this show is that there was care put into it. There are people who've never played the game but love this story. The visuals are stunning, the CGI is great, prop teams makeup and everything behind, it's good. A lot of people accidentally forget about video game stories because they're video games. Imagine how good of a Western show you could have with Red Dead 2. And now apparently they're making a Dead Space movie with James Wan. And then you also have the God of War show, a Fallout show. There's so much crazy stuff you could do now with video games that you could put onto TV. It's crazy that I'm making this video. Just like I said in the intro, I played The Last of Us when I was 12. I'm turning 21, and we're still talking about The Last of Us today. Since the show's conclusion, it's received its flowers, breaking streaming records left and right, and now the dooming question lingers. What happens now with season two, which is adapting The Last of Us part two? And the fact that season one was so good that we're now anticipating its next season, rather than ripping it apart, shows that this season succeeded at being an adaptation. <laughs> I'm excited to see what happens with season two, but 
for this chapter, we come to a close. Last of Us has been on every PlayStation generation. It's now on PC, available to everyone. It has some of the best graphics in the market right now. And it now has a mainstream television show available to everyone. It's hit the ceiling for a video game title. It's so good that it's stand its ground for 10 years and still manages to be a breath of fresh air. The Last of Us is truly one of the best pieces of media ever made. And I'm happy that I've been able to be on this high again with you watching. So don't go to sleep. Don't risk your head. I'll be the hero. I'll be the bed. Holding your dreams as you ride to rest. Evangeline. Evangeline. Don't go to sleep. Don't risk your head. I'll be the pillow. Once again, thank you to Wonder for sponsoring the video, and please visit the link in the description. Goodbye.